All right, oxygen nucleophiles. This is the first nucleophile that we're going to talk about um, simply because we've used oxygen a lot before and it's the first one that comes into um, our chapter. Now, uh, in the presence of water, ketones and aldehydes um, will be in equilibrium with its hydrate. Um, and so we see just with plain old water, a ketone or an aldehyde carbonyl compound can form this hydrate, which is similar to a diol to alcohol groups. But why it's called a specific hydrate is because uh, the carbon that holds both of the alcohols is the same one, the alpha carbon there of the carbonyl. And so um, equilibrium does not generally favor the formation of the hydrate for these uh, types of equilibriums with just water. Uh, the reaction is very slow unless we use acidic or basic conditions with it. So base catalyzed. Now this would be if the reaction arrow had water and sodium hydroxide, okay? So sodium hydroxide is the nucleophile and water is there as a proton source. Again, base catalyzed, so base catalyzed reaction is going to involve the nuke attack first and then the proton transfer, just like we talked about earlier. So hydroxide will come in, attack that carbon of the carbonyl kick up some lone pairs that makes the new carbon to oxygen bond. And then the negatively charged oxygen will do a proton transfer so that it can complete the hydrate formation. Under acidic conditions, we have a very, very similar setup, just flipped. Okay, so we'll start with our proton transfer and then we'll do our nucleophilic attack. We do have uh, one last proton transfer here as a kind of workup step so that we get our neutral hydrate uh, as a product. Now over the reaction arrow, you would see again water, but with H3O plus. First thing, proton transfer for that oxygen of the carbonyl. This makes a more reactive electrophile because that oxygen is pulling more electron density away from that carbon of the carbonyl. So it's more susceptible to attack by water, even though water is not a great nucleophile. All right, so there's that reason for using H3O plus to make the electrophile more electrophilic so that our weak nucleophile can still do a nucleophilic attack. That creates that new carbon oxygen bond. And then we'll use a second water uh, to deprotonate our, um, our oxygen to form the hydrate. That also, that last proton transfer forms H3O+, which is why this is acid catalyzed, right? We use acid in the beginning, we reform acid at the end. Now, when drawing these mechanisms, it's really important to stop right now, go back and look at your mechanisms. Under acidic conditions, mechanisms will only be reasonable if it avoids the use or the formation of strong bases. So we should not see oxygen minuses. A strong base cannot exist in an acidic environment. And the exact opposite is true for basic conditions. In a mechanism uh, for with basic conditions, it's only reasonable if it avoids the use or the formation of a strong acid. That should say or. Uh, a strong acid cannot exist in a basic environment, right? So minuses stay with the bases and pluses stay with the acids. Alcohols can also attack ketones and aldehydes, the exact same mechanism as our um, hydrate for, uh, formation, except for we are forming what we call an acetal. So we are going to use two equivalents of alcohol. Notice the two right here in front of ROH, the condensed structure of an alcohol. Um, and an acetal has uh, two ethers attached onto the exact same carbon. Uh, commonly used for acid catalyzed reactions here, sulfuric acid, TSOH, we've seen all of those before. Um, usually over the reaction arrow, we just write H plus to signify that there's some sort of acid. Um, I'm okay with you using H3O plus in the mechanisms. Um, you will see in the textbook, they'll use HA, that's A okay as well. Um, you can use TSOH. Um, or sulfuric acid as your structures. 
let's go ahead and walk through the book mechanism just so that we can see how to use HA, which is just the generic acid, all right? They protonate it so that they know, uh, so that you know it is similar to H3O+. plus. All right, so proton transfer to start off, make that electrophile more electrophilic. And then just like water, we're going to attack the carbon of the carbonyl and make that new oxygen carbon bond. We'll use uh, the conjugate acid, A, to pull off that oxygen's proton to make that first uh, carbon to oxygen bond uh, overall neutral in that functional group. Um, this is what we call a hemiacetal. Now it's very difficult to isolate a hemiacetal. There's only a few situations when we can, and we'll talk about that towards the end of our discussion. Um, but what we really wanna do is continue on and keep reacting. Now we protonate the oxygen of the carbonyl again. It's not a carbonyl anymore, it's an alcohol, but it's the same oxygen that we had started with, right? If I were to highlight this oxygen and just continue it through, we'd see, yep, that's the one that's gonna get protonated yet again. Now, we are not going to do a backside attack, okay? We have a loss of a leaving group, not with a nucleophilic attack we actually will roll down the electrons from um, our ether side, from the oxygen of the ether to kick out water. That's why we have minus water here. Um, do not come in with another alcohol and do a nucleophilic attack like a backside attack. Uh, this will not occur. Even if this was an aldehyde and not a ketone, um, there's too much steric hindrance involved with that um, carbon of uh, our electrophile. So we uh, make a pseudo style carbonyl compound, a new carbon oxygen double bond, and then we can break that carbon oxygen double bond with our nucleophilic attack. All right. And then with that new bond, we want to deprotonate it. So it's essentially two of our acid catalyzed reactions back to back to get those two new oxygen carbon bonds. If a diol is used, um, then we will actually use both equivalents of that alcohol from the same compound. So a cyclic acetal is formed and the cyclic acetal is formed because an intramolecular reaction is more favored um, than an intermolecular, right? So when we're looking at that hemiacetal, the oxygen, uh, the second oxygen on the dial is most likely going to react um, to kick out that OH group um, because intramolecular reactions are more favored. They're right there, proximity says, yeah, we're gonna do that one instead. Acetal formation is reversible. We'll go through that mechanism at the very, very end of this video, and it can be controlled by adding or removing water. So to favor acetal formation, water is typically removed from the reaction. This could be boiling it off. This could be some sort of water trap in um, a laboratory setup, um, but water is technically uh, removed. Uh, so higher concentration acid is usually seen. To convert back to, to an acetal, back to the ketone or the aldehyde, to go back to the carbonyl compound, water is added. Uh, we simply just add H3O plus, right? A, a lot of water and a little bit of acid, and that goes a long way to go backwards. So these are great ways to use protecting groups for our ketones and our, ald al our aldehydes. Protecting groups are a term that we use when we uh, want to cover up a specific functional group um, while we react other ones so that our functional group desired, like our aldehyde or ketone, doesn't leave just because we use a strong reducing agent or things like that. Now, let's look at this just to talk a little bit more about those protecting groups. Look at both of these, these carbonyls. I have a ketone in green and I have an ester in yellow. Um, my desired product is a ketone with an alcohol. So we need to convert the ester to a primary alcohol, which requires lithium aluminum hydride, which is a very, very strong 
reducing agent, right? Hydride is H minus one, lithium aluminum hydride look like this. And we know that there is a big old problem using this with this uh, original reactant. The big problem is that LAH will reduce all carbonyls. And we don't want to reduce the ketone. We want to selectively reduce the ester. Well, you can't unless you use a protecting group. Use a protecting group to actually stop the ketone from reacting, all right? So we protect the ketone by making it first an acetal. Then we will use lithium aluminum hydride and then we'll, we will deprotect. Let's look at that setup. First, step number one, protect with a acetal. Now this acetal, typically protecting groups um, are used with diols. Um, you can use any uh, alcohol that you want. Why we use the diol is because we save a little bit of money in reagents and we don't have to use twice as much alcohol because two alcohols are already present. So using that protecting group, we have effectively removed the carbonyl in step number one, but that reaction is reversible. So what we can do is protect step number one, make the ketone an acetal, then use lithium aluminum hydride, and that will only react with our ester. And then H3O plus will pop that ketone right back into its place. So acetals are great because of their reversible nature. We can put an acetal on, do some other reaction somewhere else on our molecule, and then deprotect and remove the acetal and bring it back to our ketone or our aldehyde. Now a cyclic hemiacetal, right? We said hemiacetals in the intermediates of uh, acetal reactions are very difficult to isolate. Why? Well, it's just because the, as the equilibrium is either favoring the ketone or the aldehyde and the acetal, uh, that cyclic hemiacetal is stuck right in the middle of this balancing act of, um, of equilibrium. However, the only time that we are able to isolate a hemiacetal is if it is a cyclic hemiacetal. Cyclic hemiacetals occur when we have intramolecular cyclization, when we have an intramolecular reaction. So notice we have an alcohol and that ketone over the reaction arrow, we are acidic conditions. We will stop at the cyclic hemiacetal. This is our ending point. Stop here. Now this is favored at equilibrium. A very, very important hemiacetal, a cyclic hemiacetal, um, very important to us is glucose. We do have open chain glucose and then we have cyclic hemiacetal, closed glucose. The alcohol here on this carbon will react with the carbon of the aldehyde on glucose to form whoop, hemiacetal. Look at that. Nitrogen nucleophiles. Nitrogen is very different from oxygen, okay? So nitrogen is next door to oxygen, but it reacts in a very, very different way. Under acidic conditions, aldehydes and ketones will react with a, a primary amine. We're gonna start with a primary a nitrogen with two hydrogens and one carbon group, hence the primary one carbon group, and it forms a new functional group called an imine. This was the reaction that actually um, occurs uh, in our uh, in our optical activity, right? When um, or in our in our eyes, um, when we're talking about uh, seeing color and seeing uh, the visual the um, visible spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this was one of the formations that occurs in the back of our eyeballs. So it means is a carbon nitrogen double bond. That is a new functional group that you probably have not heard before. Um, and we certainly haven't done the reaction before. 
It is under acidic conditions, but one thing I just wanna say is that this is mildly acidic. We'll talk about the pH, but it's usually a pH around five, not something so drastic like H2SO4. And so what we actually see is that this reaction um, mirrors better um, to our, uh, our basic conditions, okay? So we will start with a nucleophilic attack. Um, and that is because nitrogen is more electropositive. Uh, it doesn't like its electrons. It can hold a positive charge much better than oxygen. And so the first step that we see is nitrogen attacking the carbon of the carbonyl and kicking up a lone pair. And then our mild acid conditions will be present for our proton transfer. Why we need those acid conditions is primarily because nitrogen is in at least a primary amine is not a good acid, right? The pKa of an amine is 35 to 38, and that is way too high. Think about oxygen. Um, the pKa of oxygen of a proton with an oxygen uh, for an alcohol is around 16. So big old difference here between nitrogen and oxygens. So it might look like we're under acidic conditions, but it's mildly acidic. So we look more basic to us. Than, gen, in, than other ones. Okay, so oxygen gets a proton to make it an OH, and then the conjugate base A will come back and deprotonate that nitrogen so that we're more neutral. Uh, this is a carbenol amine. It's a carbon with an alcohol and an amine, and we'll keep going, all right? Oxygen will pick up a proton from the acid catalyst and then nitrogen will kick out water. Again, water is going to be removed from the situation. Water is easily evaporated. There's a trap there that we can use most likely in the laboratory setup. And then acid catalyzed. So we'll remake HA plus um, by deprotonating the imine. And there it is. Uh, even though it's under acidic conditions, protonated of the car protonation of the carbonyl is not the first step. Um, and primarily it's because the ammonium ion is not acidic enough to protonate the aldehyde or the ketone, but it is acidic enough to do a transfer of a proton to a negatively charged oxygen in the second step. So uh, we will have, again, mild acid conditions. You drop a little HCl in there, and what you actually have is your acid is an ammonium ion with a pKa of 10.5. Aldehydes and ketones have a pKa um, somewhere around 9 to 10, so we're not, or protonated aldehyde or ketone, so we're not going to do uh, the protonation of the aldehyde or ketone oxygen uh, in this. It's not acidic enough. Uh, again, pH has to be right around five or the reaction is too slow. Lower pH and all the amines are protonated, so none of them are able to actually be a nucleophile. At a higher pH, there's not enough acid to catalyze the reaction. Um, and so we have to be right around the sweet spot here, um, which is mild acid in our terminology, which means it's somewhere in between an acid and a base catalyzed reaction. Under acidic conditions, aldehydes and ketones can react with a secondary amine as well. They cannot form an imine. They have to form an N-amine. An N-amine is an alkene with an amine right next to it. Um, so we took an alkene and that ene ending plus an amine, and we merged it together in this lovely name N-amine. The reaction requires acidic conditions to work, but again, the mechanism is identical to the imine formation, except for the very last step. How do we get that carbon-carbon double bond? So let's walk through this one. Again, nitrogen is strong enough to attack the carbon of the carbonyl, and then we will proton transfer to make the oxygen neutral. We'll deprotonate that secondary amine so that it is also neutral and we'll get our carbonyl amine. Proton transfer just like before of the oxygen 
kick out water. Now we're at a very, very important part. This is where we change, right? We had the loss of the leaving group, and now we have to do a proton transfer. Previously, to make the imine, we deprotonated the nitrogen. We don't have any more protons on our nitrogen because now we're using a secondary amine. So we have two carbon groups and we can't deprotonate that. So how do we make that nitrogen neutral? Is by giving its electrons back. And so we actually will deprotonate the adjacent carbon to make a carbon-carbon double bond and kick the lone pairs back to nitrogen. One, two. Right? One and two. So very different last step. Um, and that is because of the type of amine we are using. If we use a primary amine, we have two hydrogens, so we can end up with the imine. If we have a secondary amine, we only have one proton. So therefore, we have to end up with the N amine. Either way, uh, the Wolf-Kishner reduction is a two-step synthesis that is actually extremely helpful. Nitrogen's uh, nucleophiles don't just have to be amines. Um, they can be different forms of the amine, right? So that R group that we were talking about before, right, doesn't have to be just a carbon, right? We'll do the reaction, lots of steps. And what actually occurs is we can make uh, very, very different looking uh, imines or enamines. But with the imine, if we have uh, this nitrogen nitrogen single bond, we can use um, basic follow up. KOH and water with a little bit of heat, and it actually will uh, reduce the overall carbon um, to be an alkane. Very, very helpful in terms of synthesis. Not necessary for uh, knowing the mechanism, not necessary for anything except for synthesis help. Uh, again, just to remind ourselves, we can have the hydrolysis of acetals. The mechanism is the exact same, just backwards, right? So we can take an acetal just like a uh, hydrate and reverse the reaction, and we'll go back to our ketones or aldehydes. Um, acetals only react with water under acidic conditions, though, so don't even try to use basic conditions to, to reverse on that one. And also hydrolysis of, in, of imines and enamines are also um, reversible. Um, they undergo very similar reactions to be reversible back to the ketones or aldehydes. Again, for practicing the reverse, the hydrolysis of these, um, add H3O plus and go backwards um, from, the, from the formation reactions.